StarCraft II Esports has just had the most surprising tournament results in its history. An underdog who has never won any premier events in his life suddenly manages to become the world champion. Today we'll dive into Oliveira's story and discuss how he achieved his victories. We'll break down his matches against the best players in the world and together we'll see his key to success. But let's start with his biography first. Oliveira started playing StarCraft II professionally in 2014, but he was known under a different nickname. Time. His appearance on the scene was already somewhat special. He was actually the youngest Chinese player to reach Grandmaster on the Korean server. Being only 14 years old, Time already established himself as one of the promising players. In the next three years, Time was gradually improving in StarCraft 2. However, he didn't really have any breakthrough moments or great achievements at that time. In the West, we don't really talk much about the Chinese scene, but there were some strong competitors like Ayasono, Maxed and Jim, and there was a lot of competition overall. So the Chinese scene has always been full of different events, tournaments and leagues, and it probably helped Time quite a lot on his journey, as he would participate in many regional tournaments, slowly building up his skill level. But his first real big year was 2018, when Time managed to win GPL, Grand Finals of the Chinese League. This meant he finally became the best Chinese player in StarCraft 2. And also this year Time was showing a lot of progress, and his hard work finally paid off with his run at WCS 2018 Montreal. If we talk about his playstyle, Oliveira got everything a good Terran needs. From great mechanics to different build orders, he was able to demonstrate a top level of play, but the only thing he lacked at that point was consistency. In 2019, he broke the pattern and started gaining more and more victories over the best players in the world. And yet there was nothing really special about the way he played StarCraft 2. And even though he would beat many good players in the next few years, nobody could have predicted his victory at the Global Finals, maybe only his dad, who has supported him from the very beginning. Anyways, his results were really good, and in almost every tournament he took part in, Oliveira was able to secure himself at least round of 8, being outplayed only by the best players like Raynor, Nip, Serral, and some others. Already at that point in time, many experienced viewers could see that one day he would become one of the best Terran players. However, from 2020 till 2023, his career started to decline. It seemed like time lost his peak form, and he would become just one of those good players who can make a living of StarCraft to esports but cannot really win a premier tournament, and there is no pressure. The pro scene is really stacked nowadays and it's incredibly hard to even stay consistent. And speaking about consistency, 2022 was a disaster for time. While he obviously remained the best player in China, he wasn't able to demonstrate even the same level he had a couple of years ago. In Dreamhack Atlanta, Time, the guy who would defeat the best Koreans and foreigners just a year ago, wasn't even able to take one map during the whole tournament. This was a disappointment, to say the least. Nevertheless, Time qualified for IM Katowice 2023 since he was the best player from his region, China. But nobody really believed in him. I put him in low chances too, and I never thought he would be able to even get out of the group. During those tough months, Oliveira was considering retirement. Perhaps he was just destined to become an average player, or as he would say, a normal man. Coming to AM Katowice, Oliveira had less than 1% chance to win this tournament, so he took an extra step to prepare for the World Finals. Oliveira practiced nearly 15 hours per day, taking all the time to become a new version of himself. And his group was insanely difficult, and he barely managed to get through with a 2-3 score, which wasn't a great sign either, and even though he got to the playoffs, nobody really considered he would be a serious threat in the next rounds. But already at that moment you could see the first signs that made Oliveira's run possible. Maybe he wasn't the best mechanical player in this tournament, maybe his builders could use a little tweaking, but this was not the deal. Oliver had an amazing killer instinct, something that only few players possess. His decision making was just above anyone else in this tournament, even if we compare him to Maru or Hero. Most players in StarCraft 2 tend to play a bit safer and take their chances only when they have a feeling that they can attack and gain something from it. In other words, most players prefer taking only calculated risks and wait for the best conditions to engage with an enemy. And our hero Oliveira took just every chance he could find. So take a look at this game against Hero Marine. Oliveira doesn't really need to engage here. Their economies and armies are even, and Hero Marine has an advantage since he's a defender and his reinforcements will come to the front line quickly. But Oliveira saw a good opportunity. Snipe two tanks, disengage and set the pace of the game, make his opponent feel a bit nervous. 
Now, pay attention to the supplies in the beginning and the end of the fight. This army, so as you scan here, you're gonna get a setup, and Hearing just doesn't know. So, Matrixes go down, the tank does get one shot off, but you're gonna be right on top of this. The Vikings get to jump on two Vikings out on their own as well, and just Hearing Marine not having the vision necessary. He does have a lot of Raven energy left, but he puts the order turrets down to watch and push the Vikings away. That's not gonna help you in the long run. You'd much rather have those as Matrixes. And now, Olivera has a choice of where he goes. He can go towards the third, he can push further up into the natural, perhaps. He's gonna dominate the tank count in this game and he's currently in the lead in the sky as well. Such engagements would happen in all series and after Hero Marine Oliveira faced Raynor. The first two games went really bad for him and we saw him being down 0-2. to two. He had only one shot from that moment and it seemed like the history would repeat itself as it had already happened many times in the past. And here we have another example of his brilliant decision making. This is probably the last army Oliveira can have in this game and he knows that. Even though he has some money at home, he is already far behind Raynor. Most of players would try to go for one or two mining bases to stabilize and try to make their economies even, but there is very little time to clear all mining bases and the only way to win right now is to go for the head and destroy the natural and the main base. However, it's also a risky decision. If you fail there, you won't achieve anything and the Zerg continues having a great economy, which ultimately means you are defeated, but if you manage to pull it off, the game is done. We're gonna double medevac drop? Well, yeah, that's actually what it is, despite so many medevacs being available. And of course, that's not all of Rainer's army. He does have a Ling run by, as we know that he always does. Tank on a high ground is even sometimes injuring their own SCVs. The Baneling snipes from time have been so darn cool. He's still continuing to do that, that picture in picture. He is actually taking out all the Banelings, hoping that his upgrades can push through. He's about to have plus three. It looks like it'll finish as the Lings all dissipate. And has Rainer underestimated this attack from Oliveira? That's a good question. The Queens are gonna try and hold the line for a little bit, even transfusing the Overseer, but they are just so many queens with so much energy <laughs> zombie up. Even with the focus fire from plus three weapon marines, it seems like the queens are buying time Here we go. for the Here old we go. Palings. Reinforcements are coming. Ruby, the reinforcements are coming. The palings aren't quite done. There's not even that many of them. Could he actually focus fire this down? Does Oliveira have a chance of this game? The tank siege is up. The wood of my guarding it. The palings are all gone. Rainer tries to go for a run by once again, but I think he needs everything back at home right here, right now. Here comes the, the swap rally and does Oliveira. Does he have enough to stand his ground? He might. The Baylings, where are they? Raider has to pull back. Raynor losing ground right now. He needs to morph into Baylings, but he's morphing him in right in front of the Marines. The Marines starting to sim themselves to death, but they know there is a timer. He's oh! going to smoke the Baylings, that zombie grub. Oh my god, I think Oliveira might be doing it. He's so overstimmed, but he is gunning for Raynor in game number two. The last few Baylings are going to be sniped. There's only three left over. The full Two few seconds late. I don't know, man. Rainer, he's got more queens, he's got more lings, he's rebuilding the Baneling nest. The upgrade's still favorable for Oliveira. Another thing that carried Oliveira in this tournament was his spirit and resilience. He was eager to fight and show his best, and it didn't seem like his nose were making him play worse. And there was one thing that all his competitors did not take into account. Everybody in this tournament underestimated Oliveira, and sure thing, nobody was preparing to face such a tough fight against him. And when you suddenly lose to the player you are supposed to win, you start doubting yourself and thoughts crave into your head to distract you. You are no longer in a flow state. In the fourth game, Oliveira demonstrated that he is fully capable of long, exhausting macro games. Why all of a sudden did all pro players struggle to defeat him? Well, as mentioned above, it's not only about his great mechanics. Everybody had that on this level. But as Sun Tzu said, if you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you'll also suffer a defeat. And most players just really underestimated him and were even somewhat arrogant. Now let's take a look at his games against Hero. You'll see all these patterns once again. His opponents try to set the pace of the game, then they'll get hit with sudden timings and unpredictable decision making, and then suddenly they'll lose confidence and their temper. So let's see the blows that Oliveira landed. The sequence here is simple. He would always choose high risk, high reward decisions over low risk, low reward ones. This is clearly upsetting for Hero because it's hard to predict and it's very uncommon on the pro scene. Such decisions could be severely punished, but nobody seemed to guess that and prevent Oliveira from doing such attacks. For example, here most players would normally go for third base, because the other option, going up the ramp, is too risky and can result in an instant defeat. 
But all the radar thinks differently though. Base right, but I think that's about as good as it's ever going to be. But he's going to stim into the natural with no regard for all these stalkers and the overcharts. And he gets a lot of stalkers. But Big Daddy Colossus is here to save the day. But Hero's going to have to micro that Colossus. He is indeed, Roddy, because there's not a lot left. And now he's going to start taking a lot of probe damage. And Oliveira's got a choice to make. No. He splits some units to the Colossus. What? The Colossus goes down. Oliveira on the counter attack. And he's up into Hero's main base. And we have got a bit of an upset to start this series. Hero is looking like he's about to admit defeat, Roddy. He's got nothing left. And when I saw the last game, I was fairly confident that Oliveira should become the next champion. Let's break it down step by step. Hero chose to play Phoenix playstyle because it's quite good against tank pushes, but most importantly, Phoenixes allow you to control the situation and force your opponent to play into you. Oliveira had two good choices, either be defensive and solid take this game into late stages or try to go for a push but he chose the third option. At this moment, Oliveira is defending his main base. The second he sees the direction where Phoenixes went, he immediately loads to Medivax and goes for a drop. It's incredibly risky and that's usually not worth it. You can lose 20 supply in one fight and you'll be far behind in the game with little chances to come back. Hero, on the other hand, considers that Oliveira can do something crazy like this. He even placed an adept to check for drops, but he's not entirely sure that his opponent would risk that and Oliveira goes for that and catches here off guard one last time. This adept needs to see these medevacs and I think he moved it a little bit. Yeah, he moved it north, man. It's, it's currently not in path to see these medevacs at all, but maybe the Phoenix realized that perhaps there wasn't enough units around. They are starting to head back down to the bottom side, so maybe the Phoenix can help as the medevac is going to see this. The medevacs aren't hooking the bottom of the map, so this should be at oh. least a chance to deny this a little bit. The boost comes in from Oliveira. He's heading for the main, but so is Hero. They immediate recall MVP, but we need a little more because if all the units on low, Four Phoenixes cannot fight this hero as he loses one of the Phoenix immediately. That stalker was walked in on the wrong side and the guys are stimming for it. They're gonna try to get on top of this overcharge battery immediately. That's a lot of pros falling. Where is the Colossus where you need it the most? It's showing up way too late, Roddy. 12 workers already down. We killed a few Phoenix. We killed some stalkers. The Colossus is off and away because there's an attack on the right side. Hero's third base is under fire and Oliveira's all over him. A Colossus and a dead. What are you gonna do? You can't save this base and Widowmines are gonna blow stuff up as well and Oliver is on fire Roddy! Starcraft 2 history, our Terran player from China seems to be doing it. We've already called him the best player from China ever to be produced but this right here is an unprecedented run. He's all over hero, he's found a crazy amount of damage. Now pay attention because the next minute is super important. The in-game situation isn't that terrible for hero. Yes, he's really behind but he still has some of his tech units and Oliveira isn't really that far ahead yet. There is still a chance, especially for the best protoss in the world. But look at how indecisive and shaken Hero becomes. His movements are weird and he struggles to make a decision. Oliveira's playstyle has completely thrown Hero off. He fails to read the game and he's visibly confused. He's not there yet, but I'm with you. That went even better than I think Oliveira could have dreamed it would go for us. He gets another lock on, throws down the scan as well. Hero needs to take a little moment for himself. He's running around the map right now in the center. Why are we here? Do we need to be here? No. He's trying to punish, I guess, a, a little minor overextension, but Hero, this is not the kind of army where you normally end games with, mate. You don't have any phoenixes anymore hero feels that he has taken too much damage and he wants to end it but how does he ever end it with this army i, I don't think he does roddy not with Oliveira pulling back he realizes man hey you're coming at me you haven't rebuilt your base widow mines are just killing units as they come Oliveira's is gonna get ready to defend this natural and potentially advance to the grand finals scv's pre pull already at that moment hero realizes he's not gonna break Oliveira's defense line but he's still doubting himself and his decision making he both tries to commit and build his economy at home, and this inconsistency eventually makes him lose the game. What do you do as hero? Well, he's gonna try, he's gonna try to bust down this bunker and micro the hell out of that one immortal, one colossus. He queues up a disrupt and now it feels a little bit disoriented, it's all over the place. We're warping in slow zealots, but Oliver's army is big, it's powerful. Hero needs the best war prism micro of all time and a couple of great force builds, but not even that is going to the save prism! him. The prism! The prism goes down! There's no more reinforcements! The Vikings are gonna go for the colossus! Oliver is gonna take down the army! Hero doesn't have anything left! His army's gone! Oliveira wipes him out! One more colossus!
chances to chase, and Oliveira is booking himself a ticket to the Grand Finals. It's StarCraft 2 history for Oliveira, it's StarCraft 2 history for the Chinese scene, I cannot believe it, but Oliveira is doing it. He is going to give us the TVT Grand Finals at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. We saw his TVT was great in the beginning of this tournament. He blew us away with the TVZ skills, but against Protoss Wadi, this man also knows what he's doing as he's going to split one more time, but history is in the making. It's Oliveira's time. Super Vary keeps the Disruptor alive. Hero is going to hang on to any hope he possibly can, but the supplies just are not there for him. He's got one Disruptor that's on cooldown. Super Battery is about to fade. Here comes a Colossus to try and be the hero of the day, but Hero needs more than a hero for himself right now. There's just no way. Surely we dive on in. The Colossus is going to go down, but the Disruptor doesn't get it because Oliveira is still watching. He is going to lift up. Hero keeps on warping in, but there's just not enough. Even if you push this back, you're down 40 army supply. Get ready for one of the most emotional pop-offs you've ever seen of a StarCraft 2 player because Oliver has been feeling it throughout this now we understand all these tricks Oliveira used to win this championship. Some people were so shocked that they were even talking about match fixing, but it's just as simple as it gets. Oliveira used a lot of psychology to deceive his opponents and his decision making was hard to predict. He never crumbles under pressure. Combined with good mechanics, game knowledge, patience and self-control, Oliveira became the next best player of StarCraft 2. And now let's see some moments with Maru. And here we can see the killer instinct once again. Take a look at how Oliveira uses his Raven. Normally you would just throw a Matrix on the closest tank to simply negate the damage and besiege your opponent on two bases, and that's something that Maru expects and hence he's pulling off to the natural. Note that once again, the Chinese player doesn't have to engage here, his economy is even and his army is only slightly better and he can easily throw his little advantage away, however, Oliveira is too quick on the draw. He immediately sees the opportunity to engage further in Maru's territory, possibly taking a victory here and now. And once again, most players won't risk it, but Oliveira somehow has a lot of experience in these situations. Alright, he's gonna come in here, probably try to disable any tank he can. Uh, he saves it actually, he's got another disable oh already. God. The Vikings are gonna be shot down. He throws down some auto turrets here in a tank. All right, those auto turrets going to have been enough. Siege is up, there was a disable there. One of his tanks lands his own Vikings and GG! Oliveira is up, three to one! Oh my God. I think in my career, I've seen Maro looking broken. Yeah. Yeah, like the look on his face, you see there, he's thinking, He's he maybe doesn't know what to do, which is never the case, because he's considered the smartest Terran in the world. After that game, Maru was completely lost, and that's very easy to see in his reaction. No matter what will happen in the next games, Oliveira has already won the battle in Maru's mind. And if we take a look at all those matches, Oliveira is an underdog who has no pressure on him, while other players will 100% expect it to win against him. He ruined each player's confidence, one after another. This is truly an amazing story, and it's probably the biggest upset in the whole history of esports. Oliveira won against the best player of each race, and he did that in a dominant fashion. And the ending speech was just priceless. So I want to thank, uh, thank you for everyone. Like you guys show me, the StarCraft 2 is not that game. <laughs> I mean, there's so many people, there's so many people to watch, and I complete my dream. I mean, even I still feel not truth. <laughs> but I want to see my, I want to see my family and use English and use Chinese and I want to see, uh, use, uh, use English first. I want to thank my dad. Like, like last time, I lose ESL Atlanta, like zero three, uh, like zero six, like no one win, uh, like, like no one give one. And my father just tell me, don't give up. Like you are always the best player in my in my heart. And yeah. And I want to see you guys. Thank you so much for watching. My uh, my English is not very well, but uh, thank you so much. And and I want to say some Chin I want to say some Chinese to my Chinese fans. I, because now uh, so, ma so many Chinese people are still watching. It's already 5 a.m. I think so. Thank you. Thank you.
，真的没有事情是什么事情不可能的。我觉得我等到这个世界冠军太久了。呃，去年去年真的很难。我上次临港六输的时候，我觉得心里头嘛，对我来说已经结束了。但是从上一次我一直谈，我告诉我自己，我可以再多练习，我可以再多练习。如果有一天真的拿我世界冠军了，或许可以证明。证明证明给大家 ，and I want to say English to all, to everyone like, even you still are normal people, you still can be world champion, and no one trusts you. What can we learn from Oliveira? Apart from his own words, it's really good to be somewhat unpredictable and take all the chances life gives you. Oliveira deserved this victory more than anyone else in the tournament. He understands human psychology and he is very good at reading the game, as well as the minds of his opponents. He proved that there is no skill limit to StarCraft 2, and in 2023 the competition will be even more brutal. And that's why we love and adore StarCraft 2, the most hardcore competitive esports. And that's it for today. Check out more videos about StarCraft 2 esports here, and as usual, have a nice day and see you next time.